It's one of the uh, <clears throat> advantages of talking after a whole bunch of other people have done. I came here and I feel like a, a bird on a you know, wire. Uh, so many different other birds are trying to sit on that wire too and we're all jumping around trying to figure out how we're going to talk. I'm not going to use any uh, my uh, daughter when I took her to a conference something similar to this. First uh, person put their slides up and she said, well, look daddy, white men petroglyphs. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, yeah, it's pretty right. So they disappear very quickly and they're gone. Ours we put up and they stay there for 10,000 years. So <laughs> I came to Akwazasne and I titled it 40 years on the river because that's the long time that I've been at Akwazasne working. I come from the Six Nations Indian Reserve down near Brantford and we sat on the Grand River, the Grand River. You guys only got the St. Lawrence up here. We got the Grand River down there. Just so happens that the same situations in both places uh, mirror some of the work that we did. The Grand River had allied chemical uh, that gave you Agent Orange. And so our river was found profoundly polluted. And as a young boy, I can remember fishing in that river for channel catfish. And oh, were they ever good. It must be that additional PCBs and all of that stuff in there that makes them taste so good. And I looked on it, I, I never really considered it because my people ate fish all the time. My people lived in the river all the time and uh, never thought too much about it. It was a clean river. You could see the fish, you could see the things. We swam in it all the time. And I wasn't really the, the bot uh, biologist that I am now, but I learned a lot from my grandparents and they were concerned about the fish populations. They were concerned about the things that they had seen change over their lifetimes. And one of the problems I see here is, is that we live so short lives. So we'll be talking about fisheries later on, but for us as Aboriginal people, Haudenosaunee people, we've seen the time when you could walk across the St. Lawrence River on the back of the salmon. My grandfather used to say that the way you cook salmon at that time was you heated up a pan red hot and then stood on the bank and, and threw it as hard as you could and it would skip across the river and by the time it got to the other side you had a salmon meal. That's how many salmon were out there. Eels? Eels were in the trillions. Trillions of eels. The water shimmered with them traveling up the St. Lawrence and the rivers. And so our people have records of that. We have memory of that. And when we look at the rivers today, and we see the reports coming out, say, oh, they look like they're doing better. Better to what? Better to the degraded things that we've seen. We talked a little bit about uh, this morning, uh, the, about the management plans and things like that, and I'll get into that a little bit further, but I'll give you my other take on this. In 1976, I came to Akwazasne to help start the uh, Mohawk Council of Akwazasne's Environmental Division or Devar Environmental Department. Uh, EPA had just started and so had Environment Canada, so I guess you guys figured that maybe it was important that you have people that were dealing with the environment, so we started around the same time. You guys seem to have grown a heck of a lot better, bigger than we have, and that's because of the way in which we were treated at that point in time. In 1976, I uh, came on board and the chief and council said, oh, we got a small project for you to do. We want you to go to uh, the archives and find all of the literature that you can on the impacts of the St. Lawrence River on the Mohawk people at Akwazasne. Having a master's degree clutched tight in my hand, I was invincible, I could do this, no problem. And I spent many a day in the archives in, in Canada looking through the papers and seeing what was there. And it's interesting to me that in, I think it was 1832, was the first mention I've seen of the Mohawks screaming at the governments for their damage to the river. They said to the British government, or 1762 I should say, that uh, they said to the British government, you're you're going to put up a Boharwa control structure to control water levels and you're going to destroy the blue stem grasses. You're going to destroy the spawning beds. You're going to destroy 
uh, the loafing areas of the various fish in this river, um, we're telling you all of the things that should be, should be taken care of. British government at that time went, oh, you're a magnificent Mohawk people. Well, because we helped them in the War of 1812. We convinced uh, both Canada and the United States that they both won the war. <laughs> you know, so today when you talk about, oh, yes, U.S., we won the war. <laughs> Canada, oh, no, we did. And the Haudenosaunee said, no, we did. We're still here. And so I looked through those papers and looked, and, and what I saw was that our chiefs, the, the sacred circle of 50 chiefs, the Grand Council of the Haudenosaunee that still exists today and still operates, went to the British government and said that this was going to happen. The British government looked at them and said, oh, you, negotiate, you Haudenosaunee are such good negotiators. We will pay you 90,000 pounds and that money at that time, which would have been billions today, for the damages that we're going to do to the river. So the chiefs went, and they went back home. We're a matriarchal society, and the clan mothers are the ones that dictate how our chiefs work. They are only spokesmen of our people. They're not kings. And when they got home, they all got balled out. <laughs> they got balled out, they said, because you didn't tell it good enough to tell them that they're going to destroy the river and they want to give you money? What's wrong with you? Go back and tell them. Do a better job of it this time. And so the Haudenosaunee chiefs went back and said to the British, look, we took 90,000 pounds, no. And they again went through the, our science, telling them about the, about the impacts and what would happen. And again, the British said, oh my God, you guys are such better. Negotiate, we'll give you 100,000 pounds. When they got home, they got a, good, a very good scolding. And if you know our tradition, uh, we try three times like that. The third time they went back, they said 120,000 pounds. And when they got home, two of the chiefs were dehorned. Their authority was taken away from them because they had been uh, not adequate enough to explain to the British why this couldn't be done. The thing about that, though, was is that we never picked up that money, or if we did, it would have been really great nowadays, but we never did. And the clan mother said to, the peop to those chiefs, no reasonable people will destroy the river. And our problem was we weren't negotiating with reasonable people. And I hate to say it, but many of those things still continue today. I like this, uh, I'm a scientist, and so I can criticize my own science, but I was uh, on the St. Lawrence River Board in 1978 when they came up with the old plan. And I also helped take part with the new one from the year 2000 and the length of the studies for the second plan. And it was interesting, in both of those plans, one of the things that the Haudenosaunee wanted in those plans was the statement that we will continue to work with you on the river until the dams are gone. We want the dams gone. Return it to a natural state. And by doing so, you'll return it to the way in which it should be running, not the way that you want it to run. And so, that was included, and I noticed that in the fine language that came after, uh, Plan D always disappeared because it was the one that was unreasonable. Well, I, I go back to that clan mother. No reasonable people would destroy the river. I think we were being reasonable. I don't think the other side even understood the terms nowadays. I would say to you that, again, in many of these cases, whether it's the remedial action plans or whether it's the uh, conditions in which we work with the governments, these are promises and treaties that were extended to us with the construction, for example, of the seaway, where we were told by the engineers that came to our community that they would regulate the water levels of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes to within one inch. It would never exceed that one inch. That's another treaty that went by the wayside. And we know that you can't do it that way. 
and we advised them that you couldn't do it that way. But they were insistent that this new technology that they had, these dams that they were putting up, that they could do this. It was sort of like thinking to yourself, we're going to adaptively manage for a meteorite impact on the Earth big enough to destroy the world. We can do that. Yeah, we can, we're like mice or ants on the ground trying to say, I'm going to get that boot out of the way so that it won't step on my home. You know, we, we have that hubris in us or the arrogance in us that we think that we can really manage those. I like the term uh, management. My uh, great-grandmother said to me um, when I first mentioned it to her, she said, yes, management is right. I said, well, oh, really? Oh, I'm happy my great-grandmother says this. She said, yes, it's what men, usually of a certain age, she said 45 to 55, and what they meant to do. And as any woman knows, you don't let them do that. <laughs> and now they figured out that they might be wrong. Oh, so we'll do adaptive management because we're not quite sure what's going to happen. And so to us, what we're saying to in many cases is we have to adapt. Management is how we adapt to the situation around us, not how we claim dominion over the earth. If you're living, living in a floodplain, you shouldn't be. Expect to be flooded. You know, if you're living in an area where you know that the waters are uh, swift and, and like in Nakrozasti some places, maybe you don't want to swim there. Again, when you look at our human beings and their responsibility to the world around them, how do you do that? We do that by understanding where we live, what is there, and we extend those responsibilities to that. Because those things that are out there will also help us. I like uh, when uh, we were talked about giving the talk together on this. We talk about the interconnecting channels, and as you could see from those old maps, which weren't marked on there, were all of the Indian reservations that sit right on those interconnecting channels. Every one of them. Why? Well, because they were huge trading areas. People could come to those interconnecting channels, trade, talk, exchange stories, get married. All of these things where our people interconnected with each other, we did it at those interconnecting channels. And so to us, they are really sacred areas. And in some cases, you didn't even find villages at those areas. Why? Because who would put up a village in the church? These were sacred places where you come together to discuss and talk and have uh, connections with your brothers. Those connecting channels are really important, but the other side of it is that I always used to like watching the IJC's map of uh, the Great Lakes because the Great Lakes were, you had all the lakes here, and then you see all this little ribbon. Some of the original maps I saw don't even have that ribbon of the St. Lawrence River. It just stops right at Lake Ontario. Now it has a little bit of a ribbon, and as soon as it hits Quebec, it stops again. So I'd like to know what happens when you stop the river like that. Does it back up and flood everybody? And I don't know. It's like, I'm a biologist, but when I look on the maps, I see these type of ambiguities. And what about the lost lakes? What about the lakes that we don't talk about? <laughs> the Finger Lakes of New York, they're all connected to, to the St. Lawrence and to the Great Lakes, Lake St. Clair, beautiful place to go, to go fishing, Lake Nipigon, and probably a hundred other lakes that are all within the watersheds that are, have really great significance to the people who live there, Lake Simcoe. These are all lakes that connect, and if we don't consider them part of the equation, then we also are making a mistake and an error. We have a, a story about uh, our creation story, and I won't go into the whole story, it only takes 12 days to tell, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the uh, Reader's Digest abridged version, where uh, we had two brothers that were born. One was called a light brother, and one is called a dark brother, and of course, everybody's gonna go, oh, one is good and the other one is evil. No, that's not the way. Light and dark are only two reflections of the world we live in. 
the Light Brother, of course, he was wanting to create things, so he created a whole bunch of stuff, and he created rivers. He said, oh, this is great. And he created rivers as straight as a die, just like the St. Lawrence River. I think it's the one of the ones that the Dark Brother didn't get out to change, but straight as a die. And he made the rivers flow in both directions. That's so that people get into one side in the morning, go down the river, come back in the night, no, no, no work, you know, it's great. The Dark Brother, however, looked at this and said, oh, these new people we're putting here have to be challenged or they'll grow fat and lazy and they won't do anything. I'm gonna change this. So he made the rivers flow in one direction. He put waterfalls in them and he made great huge chan channels and things that changed and made great variety in those rivers so that different animals could live there. And maybe to us as human beings, we looked at that river and went, oh my God, the Dark Brother created so much trouble for us. It's just terrible. Oh yeah, and he did make it unpredictable as how they rise and lower and go their flows. And he did that for a reason, so that we would think about these things and work with the river, not against it. And so the Dark Brother, for example, and I'll use another example, in the concept of a rose. The Light Brother made a beautiful flower, absolutely gorgeous, had a beautiful fragrance. And if you ever had some rose pebbles sometimes, you can see that they even have a nice taste to them. And every animal in the world wanted to eat them, and did. The Dark Brother looked at the rose and said, hmm, I'm gonna give you thorns. I'm gonna put you in a bush. Now you can protect yourself against the animals around you. So to the rose, who was the good brother? wasn't the light brother who gave him all the things that made him get trampled on and eaten. It was the dark brother that allowed him to be able to protect themselves. And we were given the same choice. You can either dominate the world around you or you can live with it and adapt to it. You can accept your responsibilities for the rivers, the lakes, the lost lakes, the interconnecting channels, or you can build laws that tell you what your rights are on that river and suffer the consequences. So some of the things I see us doing nowadays, we're suffering the consequences of that arrogance that we've had in the past. And I think it's time that we start to understand the rivers, interconnecting channels better so that we can learn how to adapt to that and not it adapt to us. Thank you.